Thanks for that, Dennis. It's such a big deal to be here at PRS talking about alchemy, showing work related to alchemy. Manly Palmer Hall traveled throughout Europe and brought a bunch of rare alchemical manuscripts back to LA that now sit in the Getty collection. Uh, Manly Palmer Hall has a huge amount to do with my interest in alchemy. Many of us have probably looked at the secret teachings of all ages beguiled by J. Augustus Snap's beautiful illustrations of esoteric teachings. And it's a huge honor and a thrill to be here. I'm going to introduce myself in a second, but we'll start with Sydney Buffman talking to us about this apparatus in the center of the table. And then I'll jump into alchemy, perfume making, and all that. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Sydney, and I'm really excited to be here today. I got a little bit of stage fright, so excuse me for that. Um, this is a Portuguese copper still. It's a traditional still. Do you know how old it is? That design, as far as I know, was perfected in the 9th century in what was then called Persia. It hasn't changed since. Yeah. Um, what we have uh, boiling in here is two kinds of lavender, um, one of which came from a, a garden of someone I met at the hardware store. <laughs> um, and it's, let me see. I'm going to walk you through how I set this up. So you want to do one cup of flour, I think the flour I mean lavender and three cup water. Don't overfill it. If you ever do this at home, you're going to be tempted to overfill it. Don't do that, or you'll get a blowout. Um, and then it is sealed with something called rye paste, which is the reverse um, of ratio of what I just said, which is that it's three parts uh, flour to one part water. Um, yeah, And then it's What's happening here is the water is breaking apart the cells, the cell wall of the flower, and the oils and the water soluble components are coming out and they're turning into a mist and kind of circling around in here. And this mist circles down through here into this condenser, where then it hits into this cold water, which you're going to see me refill this up a lot because my that's really analog. Um, so we're trying to keep this from getting too hot. I will, it will boil over if, if it's unattended. And, and then it, the vapor comes down, condenses into here. And this is the hydrosol. Which is what? Which is, <laughs> which is the water and the oils and the volatile and the, the components and the, uh, the water solids, the components of the flour, kind of evenly distributed. The oils are kind of evenly distributed in this water. So this is how you also make essential oil, but this still is too small to yield enough oil. This is like the smallest um, distillation set I think you can get. Um, so this will only make hydrosol, but in a larger still, you would see like a layer of oil kind of floating on the top. And there is like, you'll see there, there is, um, little dapples of oil. So I've made, we made some uh, batches for you guys. There's a table full of them over there. Um, feel free to take them on your way out. But you'll see that, I didn't filter them, you'll see that there's a little oil on the top. And there's all kinds of things you can do with essential, essential oils. You can spray them on your face, you can put them in your bath, you can even cook with them, you can spray them on top of a cocktail. There's a lot of uses. Cool, thanks, Sid. My name is Eliza Swan, and I founded the Golden Dome in 2014 as a space for artists who are interested in looking at how mystical practice and creative practice interweave. And I came into looking at alchemy because it's this beautiful, fully interdisciplinary art that's a combination of visual culture, literary culture, science, philosophy, mysticism, and it's a huge, expansive practice. 
I've only been looking at the European branch of alchemy, which is what we'll look at tonight, and I've only been doing it for 10 years, which means I don't know anything. So aren't you glad you bought a ticket? But um, I'm gonna talk to you about distillation and what some of the philosophic and spiritual connotations to distillation are. And then we're gonna go through some basics of European alchemical theory. And at the very end, I'll talk to you about perfume. So if it sounds like we're talking about everything, but we'll get there in the end. And I wanted to start with this map because when I first started looking at alchemy, I didn't understand how expanded the practice is. And I'm gonna talk about it in terms of geography and time, just briefly. So there are, <laughs> I'm looking at my notes and it says, well, what is alchemy? I'm like, what? Well, I didn't even explain. Um, it's a syncretic discipline that is a mixture of, as I said, philosophy, science, mysticism, visual culture, literary culture, and Brian Cottenwar, who's an alchemist based in Brooklyn, New York, calls it the poetry of matter, which I think is a perfect definition for alchemy. There are many different alchemies, Chinese alchemy, so if we look at this map, it basically goes into all those spaces that are highlighted. And I'm gonna give you a sort of a rough geographic chronological breakdown of where alchemy happened, just to let you know how many branches there are in case you wanna dive into anyone in particular. There is Chinese alchemy, which is highlighted in, well, China's highlighted in yellow on this map. And the oldest manuscripts we think are from 73 BCE. And Chinese alchemy still exists actually in the form of many traditional Chinese medicines. A lot of Chinese acupuncture and herbal traditions were rooted in alchemical practices and studies. And there is Indian alchemy. The earliest records we have from the Indian alchemists come from the third century CE. And Indian alchemy contains many disciplines. Many of them are still active as well. A lot of Ayurvedic medicines were cultivated by Indian alchemists, mainly between 900 and 1300 CE. There's Egyptian alchemy, which the earliest manuscripts we can find relating back to Egypt are from the third century CE. The Greeks colonized Egypt, and then we have Egyptian Greek alchemy starting in the 4th century CE in Alexandria. Islamic alchemy flourished in the 9th century CE. And the Islamic alchemists took the practice of distillation to a whole new level and started to figure out how to get into a kind of protochemistry. I had a scientist yell at me for saying that. Um, they didn't know what chemical compounds were, but they really refined the art of distillation and began to get really fine alcohols through this apparatus, um, which then up-leveled abilities to make medicine, to make alcohol-based perfumes, which prior to that were oil-based, which I'll talk to you about in a second. And alchemy hit Europe last. They think in the 12th century with the translation of the Arabic book of the composition of alchemy. And we're gonna hang out in Europe, so it's mostly what I've looked at. This is a 17th century engraving of a distillation apparatus. Distillation is a really old practice. Um, what I love about it, it's so beautiful. We're gonna look at the Emerald Tablet in a little bit. The way that distillation was probably discovered was that people observed the way that the planet recycles its fluids, which is that the earth heats up during the day, vapors evaporate, and then rise up and cool and fall back down. And so one of my teachers told me that in Egypt, to figure out how to clear their water, they came up with a distillation apparatus that mimicked the way that Earth clears its water. So essentially you'd heat water, it would rise up into a vapor, and the sediments that were too heavy to rise up as a mist would stay at the bottom, and then clear water would come down through that arm. And it's basically a mimic of what planet Earth does. So 
We've got lavender cooking in there, getting hot, the mist rises, and then it cools as it comes down the condenser. And as it cools, as Sid was saying, it separates into three things, which is important in European alchemical philosophy, and we'll get into that in a second. So this is a replica of an early Indian distillation retort, where they would heat up the bottom of this clay vessel and the steam would rise and then drip down the sides of the clay vessel and collect at the bottom. This is a 9th century glass Arabic alembic. So the alembic is the thing at the top there where the vapor condenses. And my friend who's a glassmaker replicated how Arabic glassmakers in the 9th century would have made this thing. She made the clay oven, no thermometers, kept it heated 24 hours a day and tried to make the same shape, and it was near impossible. So they were very advanced at glass making. This is an image from the 18th century from an Arabic book. And this is a glass still. And they pretty much haven't changed in design since they were, some people say, perfected in the 8th and 9th century in what was then called Persia. This is Maria Prophetessa. This is an engraving from Michael Meyer's book from the 17th century. Maria Prophetessa was a Greco-Egyptian alchemist. We don't have a lot of records of her. She was said to have invented many of the distillation units that we still use. And Zosimos of Panopolis, I'm going to talk to you about a little later wrote about her first and called her the mother of all alchemy. And I bring her in because she's demonstrating really beautifully in this engraving how distillation works, bringing vapors up from the ground and then collecting them down from the heavens, which is important in terms of thinking of the psychopoetic idea of distillation that alchemists had. This is an early alchemical still where basically the steam would rise up through this clay pot and come down these two arms. Maria Prophetessa was rumored to have designed this thing. And it's called the Pelican Retort in alchemical literature, which is also important. We'll talk about that in a little bit. This is an illustration from the thesaurus. I'm going to bundle this. I don't speak Latin. The sororum, the sorus the sororum of distillation and of all of the beautiful energies that come up and out through the distillation process. You can see the Archangel Michael slaying a devil <laughs> through alchemy, uh, so through distillation, through alchemical distillation. It's another page from the same book demonstrating how glass stills worked in the 17th century when this book was produced. I'm going to read to you from the Emerald Tablet. So this is a text that was highly regarded by Islamic and European alchemists as the foundation of their art. It's attributed to a figure called Hermes Trismegistus, who is a syncretic deity. He's basically a mas mashup between the Egyptian god Thoth, who is the god of writing and magic, among other things, and the Greek god Hermes, who was the god of magic and messages, among other things. When the Greeks occupied Egypt, they ran around trying to find ways to parallel their own mythology with Egyptian mythology, and they came up with Hermes Trismegistus as a syncretism between Thoth and their own Hermes, and he's a distinct deity. He was said to have written this text, although it seems to date from the 8th or 9th century from Arabic sources. What I do want to mention, I think it's important for us as artists thinking about alchemy, is that in the alchemical imagination, if you call the god Hermes Trismegistus to you and have a conversation with him, you're having a conversation with him. 
So there's this sense that all wisdom can be accessed from within because we're all made from the same things. And I love the alchemical tradition for that reason. It's really um, as arcane and complex and symbolic and off-putting as it can seem. The more you look at the literature, the more you feel invited into it. And I'm going to read the Emerald Tablet to you. It's an important text, and for me, it's also a metaphor for distillation, and it can help us maybe look at distillation through the alchemical eye. This is a translation by Idris Shah, who's a Sufi writer and poet. So it starts out, in truth, without deceit, certain and most veritable, which just means I'm not lying. That which is below corresponds to that which is above, and that which is above corresponds to that which is below, to accomplish the miracles of the one thing. And just as all things have come from this one thing through the meditation of one mind, so do all created things originate from this one thing through transformation. So there's different translations of this text. This one I find the most legible. But they're basically articulating this notion that we're all the meditations of this one mind. So you can think of creation as being a consciousness, imagining us all into being and constantly transforming us as it's dreaming us awake. As above, so below has become a catchphrase in a lot of esoteric circles. And it corresponds to distillation directly, which is to say that alchemists considered the rising vapors to be things of the earth coming up, meeting the celestial realm, grabbing the celestial realm and bringing it back down to earth in this giant circulation that's happening all the time. And I've read some modern scholars speculating that alchemists thought that the entire universe is being distilled and refined as time marches on. Its father is the sun, its mother the moon. The wind carries it in its belly, its nurse is the earth. So like many, most all alchemical texts that I've looked at, this is couched in symbolism for various reasons. Um, alchemy is a distinctly poetic, beautiful, visionary art, and I think the nature of reality is poetic, so it's reflected in the literature. Alchemists also wanted to keep their teachings amongst each other, among the initiated, for many reasons. Um, alchemy is dangerous. You could, if you put alcohol in this thing, blow up this entire building if you didn't know what you were doing. And also philosophically, it's something that has to be meditated on for a long time. This text I've looked at for almost a decade, and I'm still unpacking it. So I encourage you all to pin a copy up over your desk and just think about it and let it move through you. I'll continue. I digressed. It is the origin of all the consecration of the universe. Its inherent strength is perfected if it is turned to birth. Separate the earth from fire, the subtle from the gross, gently and with great ingenuity. So this little paragraph here is talking about pulling the subtle out of the gross, pulling the invisible out of the visible, the intangible out of the tangible, which is essentially when you're distilling is what you're doing. You're putting material plants into this vessel and sucking up its energy or its vapors and then separating them out through the process of heating and cooling. It rises from earth to heaven and descends again to earth, thereby combining within itself the powers of both the above and the below. Thus will you obtain the glory of the whole universe. All obscurity will be clear to you. This is the greatest force of all powers because it overcomes every subtle thing and penetrates every solid thing. In this way was the universe created. From this comes many wondrous applications, because this is the pattern. Therefore am I called thrice greatest Hermes, having all three parts of the wisdom of the whole universe. Herein have I completely explained the operation of the sun. 
So there's a lot to glean from these short passages, and I won't be able to unpack it all because I don't know how. Um, what I can say, though, is that I have a much bigger copper still in my kitchen. And I walk through Prospect Park, and I meditate with different trees, and I see who wants to come back to my house to be slaughtered and boiled. And then I have my still running, and there's a copy of the Emerald Tablet hanging just behind it. And I read this while ingredients are distilling, and I really appreciate the way that the rhythm of this text seems to move through the still and how they seem to illustrate each other. Hopefully that was coherent. I just want to say one thing. Also, yeah. there's something about the process of working with this still that encourages you to be present with it, which I feel like is part of the spiritual practice. Like, if you were to walk away from this, you'd be in trouble. Something bad had happened. <laughs> right. You know, like, it really wants you to pay attention to the way it fluctuates, to what it needs to adjust the fire, adjust the temperature, adjust the water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an absolute meditation practice to practice distillation. And I recommend practicing it. If you can, you can get these pretty affordably now. Uh, copper ones are great, they're really easy to clean. Copper is super heat conductive, so it works really efficiently. And I actually have a wild glass apparatus. It's a modern distillation rig. And I hate setting it up. It's just annoying. These are really simple to use. Um, I'll put this on Etsy. <laughs> so I'm going to talk to you about something called the tree, oh, excuse me, I'm stumbling. The Tria Prima. Paracelsus, who was active in the 15th century, was a Swiss physician, alchemist, lay theologian, and philosopher in the German Renaissance. And Paracelsus said that plants grow on Earth, that grow on Earth are terrestrial stars, and the planets in the cosmos and the sky are celestial plants. What shines above reflects below and vice versa. The planets and the plants are inextricably tied, which I'll talk about specifically concerning lavender in a little while. But by understanding the highway that connects them, you receive this profoundly deep understanding of plants, and they come in and transform your practice. And I love imagining plants growing up out of the earth, and then stars as plants sort of growing upside down, and the two being a mirror of each other. The Tria Prima, so you see these symbols underneath the angel's head, and going from left to right, you have mercury, sulfur, and salt. So sulfur, mercury, and salt are considered to be, in the European tradition of alchemy, the three constituents of anything that has a body. And what a body is and is not is up for debate in this tradition, as all these things are. A person, a plant, anything in the natural world has a body, anything with a distinct physical body. There are also traditions that say that ideas and places and projects have bodies that can be dissected into sulfur, mercury, and salt. So sulfur relates to the soul of the plant, and it relates to the essential oils that come out of the plant. And I'm going to talk about what they meant by soul in a second, because it's slightly different than modern vernacular. And then the mercury alludes, excuse me, to the alcohol and water soluble constituents in plants. So that would be the hydrosol that Sid was talking about. And the salt is the plant body, or it's alkaline mineral salts. And these have philosophical and spiritual meanings as well. But when you distill a plant, you get the body, which is the plant material, to produce two distinct things, its soul and its spirit, its sulfur and its mercury. So soul and spirit in modern vernacular are used interchangeably but, and this has been explained to me in lots of different ways, so I'll just give you the easiest one that I can think of. Actually, Brian Cottonlar, um explained it to me this way, and I think it's a good way to think about it. The soul, or the essential oil of any being, but of plants, because that's what we're talking about today, is what is distinct to that particular plant. It's the individual plant's being, and it's the immaterial aspect of that individual plant's being. The mercury, 
which is connected to the spirit of the plant and the hydrosol, is connected to what that plant shares with all the other plants in its species. So for example, the soul of the different lavender plants that went in there are their individual personalities getting cooked up in our distillation unit. The spirit or the mercury is essence lavender, what makes lavender, lavender. And the salt, as I said, is the salt, alkaline salt components of the plant or the plant body. This is from the Sam Lung Alchemister, this really beautiful 19th century German alchemical manuscript. And you can see the alchemist here. He's blowing out salt and sulfur out of his nose, and he has mercury in his abdomen. And so the Tree of Prima is how most European alchemists broke down not just the physical matter of bodies and plants, but also the essential nature of ourselves. This is from Clavis Artis, a 17th century alchemical manuscript. And you can see the soul and the spirit of this plant holding hands inside of the alchemical retort. And distillation was considered to be the method by which you got the soul and the spirit of a plant to surrender and sacrifice themselves to you. So it was a big deal. Distillation is basically ritual sacrifice. And you have the lotus flowering out of the top, the awakening or the awareness of the soul and the spirit marrying, which has other philosophic connotations in alchemy that I won't get into. This thing right here is called the Azoth of Basil Valentine. It's from 1544. And at the bottom, that triangle, this is corpus with the cube. That's the salt of this being. In the upper left-hand corner, there's the sun that says anima. That's the soul of this being whose face is at the center. There's the spirit of this being, which is up in the upper right corner, represented by the moon. And then we have the alchemist standing in the classic Greek elements, water, earth, fire, and air. And then spinning around their head is glyphs for all of the seven planets that they knew of then. We now know that the sun and the moon are not considered planets, but this is what they were working with. So you have Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, the sun, Venus, Mercury, and the moon going around clockwise. And these were considered to be the essential components of anything that exists on Earth. You also see glyphs for different metals going throughout this. And there was a theory that metals were the hardened energies of planets beaming down to Earth. Same with plants, too. They were considered to be celestial energies that were concretizing and making themselves manifest on Earth. This is also from the Sam Long Alchemister. It's a text I just ran into recently, and I love the illustrations in it. They're so goofy. But you can see all the planets lined up here in a circle. And so when you distill a plant, not only do you get its soul and its spirit, its essential nature sacrificed to you, but you also get the planetary correspondence of the plant offered to you, which you can use in your magical practices, in your scientific practices, in your personal practices, in your artist practices. Here are all the planets dragging this alchemist across a field of flowers in a chariot, pretty beautiful. The sun is cracking the whip. This is an image. It's a Michael Meyer image from the 17th century, I think. My brain is drawn a blank. Um, and this is the soul and the spirit in a distillation unit. So you see a lot of European alchemical manuscripts sort of illustrating distillation as the sun and the moon in a hot tub together, combining their forces to make one thing. So in the alchemical imagination, they have a concept called coagulate and dissolve, come together, fall apart, come together, fall apart. And they felt that the whole rhythm of nature was things coming together and falling apart, 
coming together and falling apart, which is really useful if you live a weird artist life and everything's falling apart. You think, well, it's going to come together. That's the order of nature. It's another image depicting a similar scenario of the sun and the moon, the soul and the spirit holding hands and making one unified substance. And we can relate that to distillation pretty easily, I think. This is another image from Clavis Artist. Let me just check the time. I feel like I'm talking in a slow way, like I'm on talk radio. We're doing good. So this is a snake nailed to a cross. And it's also representative of what goes on in distillation, right? We have the serpent's tail pointing up, the terrestrial energies of the globe at the bottom, rising up the crucifix, and then we have the serpent's tongue pointing down, the celestial energies raining down on Earth. The reason I brought this image in is that it relates to this idea of sacrifice that I think is really important when you think about distillation from an alchemist perspective, or as best we can. And actually, just having talked about the Tria Prima, right, and the Emerald Tablet and distillation, you can start to almost demystify these manuscripts pretty quickly, right? So we have a three-headed dragon in the corner, sulfur, mercury, salt. We have a three-headed flower over there. These things start to make sense the more you look at them, if you just have some basic sort of riddle-solving keys. I'm going to read to you a little bit from this text by Zosimos of Panopolis, who I'm actually going to talk about specifically. I'm a huge fan of Zosimos. I think his practices and his teachings are so relevant to artists today. He was an, a Greco-Egyptian alchemist and Gnostic mystic who lived at the end of the 3rd and beginning of the 4th century CE. He was born in Panopolis, which was in Egypt, and he lived in Roman-occupied Egypt. And this is a text called Visions of Zosimos. I'm just going to read little snippets from it, and actually, we're going to spend a bunch of time on it on October 8th. I'm doing a donation-based talk just about Zosimos through PRS, so if you're interested in him, you should come to that one. So Zosimos puts himself into a trance and is distilling copper, probably in sulfur water, and probably in a corrosive that they call vitriol. And he puts himself into a trance to try to figure out what's going on with this distillation and to ask it questions. So here's how the vision opens. The composition of the waters, the dance, the growth, the flowering and decay of the corporeal, the separation and the conjunction of spirit and body. These are not the result of discrete natures, but of a single nature acting upon itself. A uniform quality, such as the solidity of metals or the moisture of plants. Within this single system of many colors, the quest, shimmering in myriad, is preserved. In accord with time's measured rhythm, it synchronizes with the waxing and waning of the moon as nature flows through itself in cycles of contraction and expansion. So all throughout the literature, poetry and visual culture of Western alchemy, you see these themes coming up of contra contraction and expansion, things dissolving and coagulating, things acting upon themselves through cycles that are endless. And it's all coming from this one nature that if you read the Emerald Tablet this way, not everyone does, but this one nature could be thought of as a consciousness that's just thinking about you and that's why you're here, which I find comforting, strangely. And so Zosimo says this to himself, and then he starts to talk to the thing that's in his alchemical retort. After I uttered these words, I fell into a trance and saw before me a sacrificial hierophant perched atop a broad, bowl-shaped altar. A ladder, a ladder sorry, I can't read, of 15 steps climbed to its top. 
a hierophant arose and a voice from above addressed me. I have accomplished the descent of the 15 steps of night and have ascended the 15 steps of illumination. The one who sacrifices me also revives me through casting aside the heavy sediment of the body. And since by the will of necessity I am an initiated hierophant, I become spirit. So hierophant is a Greek word that roughly translates to priest for the tarot readers among us. And this hierophant is the material that Zosimos is distilling, talking about rising up and climbing down, rising up and climbing down, and being sacrificed and revived by casting aside the body and taking their essential nature or their spirit over into the other side of the still. As we spoke, the water continued to boil and the people screamed. I saw a man made of copper who held a lead tablet in his hand. He stared at the tablet and proclaimed, I command all those who suffer to be calm, to take up a tablet and write with their own hand. Turn your face to the sky and keep your mouth open till your uvula is swollen. The act followed the word and the Lord of the house said to me, you have seen Craning your neck upwards, you have seen what is accomplished. This man of copper is the sacrificial hierophant and the sacred offering. It is he who vomited his own flesh. The power over this water and those who suffer was given to him. After experiencing this vision, I awoke again and asked myself, how to interpret this? Is this the white and yellow water boiling and divine? So the art shows in the gallery out back is named after this. But I bring this text in just to show you what sacrifice meant to alchemists in terms of working with their materials. So we don't just grab lavender and chuck it into a still. It's a being that has sacrificed their physical body to give you their spirit. And the offering is considered to be sacred. It's also considered to be something that you yourself can communicate with. And by meditating on distillation and the notion of sacrifice and the notion of what it means to give up what is valuable to you to attain something more ultimate is important when you think about distillation. And I'll just read this last little bit because it's so beautiful. And it again reiterates kind of how distillation moved through the alchemical imagination in this beautiful, mystical, poetic way. I found that I understood it correctly, and I said that it was beautiful to speak and lovely to hear, beautiful to give and to receive, lovely to be rich and to be poor. How does nature learn to give and to receive? The man of copper gives and the water stone receives. Metals give and the plants receive. The stars give and flowers receive. The sky gives and the earth receives. Thunder yields flashing fire. All things are interwoven and unravel. All things mingle and fuse. All things mingle and disperse. All things moisten and dry. All things flower and bloom in the bowl-shaped altar. For each, the conjunction and separation of all occurs through method, measure, and the weight of the four elements. There is no chain of being without this method. Inhalation and exhalation are the method of nature. The order of the method is preserved through expansion and contraction. Simply, when all things unite and separate in harmony, and no part of the method is neglected, then nature is transformed. Nature rotates and cycles back upon itself. This is the chain of being and the nature of the art for the whole cosmos. So Zosimos is meditating on how nature comes together and falls apart. And he also zooms out macrocosmically and sees the entire cosmos essentially distilling itself, forming, falling apart, forming, falling apart. Contemporary physics tracks with this idea, actually, right? Our universe, according to modern calculations, is infinitely expanding, and then at some point it will collapse in upon itself, and it might decide of its own accord to expand again and collapse again over and over. We don't know. This is a page from Manly Palmer's Hall's Secret Teachings of All Ages. It's an illustration by J. Augustus Knapp, who's so incredible. 
And I brought this in because here's a pelican pegging its own chest and feeding blood to its young. Of course, we have the Masonic compass and a rose coming up the cross, which points to Masonic traditions and Rosicrucian traditions, which I'm not going to get into. But I wanted to talk about this pelican pegging its own chest because it's a symbol of Christ and of sacrifice. I tried researching the origin of this myth that pelicans peck their own chest and feed blood to their young. I'm not really sure why the medieval imagination made that story. But it's a symbol of sacrifice. It's a symbol of throwing aside what you think is important to you in order to attain what is actually important or the higher kind of spiritual goal. Although I hate to use the term higher because in fact what I love about alchemy is that they value the above and the below equally. So I don't want to use the term higher as though it's better. Um, I would say that the pelican is a symbol of how we can learn to make these greater sacrifices in order to attain greater understanding, deeper compassion, and more ability and breadth to have compassion and to give. This is from a Ripley scroll. One of these was on display at the Getty recently. It's so beautiful. I'm not sure if it came from Manny Palmer Hall's collection or not. Um, but this is a spirit of a plant being distilled. And so you can see kind of how they picture the plant sacrificing themselves and the blood dripping down and what it meant for the plant to give of themselves in this way. This is from the Kabbalah Mineralis, and you see this little alchemical baby inside the glass retort. The little cap on the top is called the Alembic. And so you can see that alchemists over and over pictured what was going on in terms of distillation as an actual being giving of itself through this process of being heated and turned into a vapor. This is a Roman fresco of perfume. And actually, just for the last minute here, I'm going to talk about perfume and what it means in the context of the alchemical imagination. So if you think about a plant sacrificing itself to give oh, untrusted server certificate, I'm going to trust you anyway. Um, here in this perfume vial, you don't just have something that smells good you actually have the soul and the spirit of a plant or a wood or a material that sacrificed itself to give you its essential nature. And for that reason, perfumes in the ancient world were considered to be inspirited, and they could do all kinds of things besides just smell good. You could wear perfumes that would scare off demons. You could wear perfumes that would attract lovers. You could wear perfumes to honor certain deities and certain planets. You could wear perfumes to do religious and funerary rites. And the spirit that was contained in the vessel was considered to be holy and to be the result of sacrifice, concentration, and an incredible amount of skill. Getting plants to release their essential oils and their hydrosols before there were camping stoves and thermometers and rubber tubing and mason jars to catch things it was an incredibly difficult and refined art. There are lots of ways to get perfumes besides distillation. Egyptians used a technique called enfleurage, where you take flowers and you can press them into fat or beeswax, where they absorb the fragrance. Um, you can press flowers and plants. Not every plant responds to distillation very well. Some of them fall apart. Um, and they don't release any of their oils or compounds because they're too fragile to be heated to that degree. Distillation is one of my favorite ways to extract from plants, though, because I hearken it back to these alchemical ideas of things rising up from earth, ascending to the heavens, things from the heavens descending and collecting on earth in physical form, in this constant cycling and resurrection, death, rebirth, sacrifice, all of these things happening in this beautiful apparatus. And I wanted to talk just for a second about lavender in particular, because that's what we made for you. So this is a copy of something called Culpepper's Herbal, which was published in the 18th century. 
but it gives all of the planetary correspondences to the plants that were worked with medicinally at that time. It's still in print, you can still grab a copy, and so if you're curious about which planets govern which herbs or plants you want to work with, and if you want to harness the powers of those plants, you can do that by using this text and many others. Um, I'm going to read to you from Culpepper's Herbal about lavender. Lavender, being an inhabitant almost in every garden, it is so well known that it needs no description. It flowers about the end of June and beginning in July. Government and virtues. Mercury owns the herb and it carries his effects very potently. Lavender is of a special good use for all the griefs and pains of the head and brain that proceed of a cold cause, as apoplexy, falling sickness, the dropsy or sluggish malady, cramps, convulsions, palsies, and often faintings. Two spoonfuls of the distilled water of the flowers taken helps them that have lost their voice, as also the tremblings and passions of the heart and faintings and swooning, not only being drank, but applied to the temples or nostrils to be smelled unto. But it is not safe to use it where the body is replete with blood and humors because of the hot and subtle spirits wherewith it is possessed. The chemical oil drawn from lavender, usually called oil of spike, is of so fierce and piercing a quality that it is cautiously to be used, some few drops being sufficient to be given with other things, either for inward or outward griefs. So this is what we're sending you away with today, is lavender hydrosol. There'll be a little bit of the soul of the plant in there too, there'll be some oils. And it's great for grief, if anyone's dealing with that. I know I am, not to TMI all of you. It's also supposed to be relaxing. You can anoint your temples. If you're feeling woozy or wobbly, according to Culpepper, you can apply it under the nose or the temples to stabilize yourself. Um, that's all I have. Yeah. So I think we'll take questions, if you have any. I'm gonna put the slideshow back to a beautiful image. There, I like this person. So any questions about perfume, perfume making, distillation, any of these alchemical texts? Yeah. There is a microphone over there, you can use it. Oh, yeah, if yeah. you want to use that microphone, if you have a soft voice, you can just get it out. Yeah, so from what I understand, ancient Egyptians were really good at changing the colors of metals. And so a lot of alchemists applied their art to that. Um, from what I've learned, ancient Egyptians weren't trying to hustle anybody. They really liked gold. So they would figure out how to transmute metals so they, that they had more of a gold color so that people who couldn't afford gold could get gold-like things. And they produced texts called chrysopoeias, which is the Greek word for gold making. And many of these practices made their way over to Europe eventually. And some alchemists, anyone correct me if I'm wrong with my dates or geography, from the Greco-Egyptian tradition and then over in the European tradition were like, wait a minute. If I'm the imagination of the one thing, and I am also God, if you read the Corpus Hermeticum, there's a beautiful passage about how you can't know God until you recognize that that's what you are, right? So some alchemists were like, I think we can actually do this. I think we can actually make gold in the laboratory. And so there are a ton of texts about that. There are texts about how to change the colors of metals, and there are texts that attempt to actually create gold in the laboratory. I'm not a laboratory alchemist, so I don't know what that entails. But a friend of mine who is was like, yeah, you can make gold in the laboratory these days, but it's more expensive and more of a pain than just extracting gold the old-fashioned way. Um, 
But all of the metals have a planetary correspondence, right? So gold connects to the sun, which is connected to the soul, which was what alchemists aspire to cultivate in themselves. So it had a high value, not just monetarily, but also spiritually. But plants likewise have planetary correspondences. And there were lots of projects that alchemists worked on. They worked on medical projects. Distillation is also used to make medicines. Um, they worked on philosophical projects. They worked on mind, body, spirit projects. The Indian alchemists came up with many of the yogas that a lot of us study today. Um, and that's kind of a syncretic discipline between movement, breath, philosophy, medicine, self-awareness, cosmic awareness, terrestrial awareness. So it's a huge field of study. Yeah. What were the first plants or flowers that you ever attempted to distill, and how did it turn out? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, yeah. A long time ago, someone I was dating gave me this glass alchemical set for Christmas one year. I was so excited. And I ran out into my yard. I was living in Mount Washington. And I cut up this juniper plant and stuck it in there. And immediately, because it was a scientific grade distillation unit, I was able to dial in the temperature. And I had a cooling pump that was making everything work efficiently. And within 40 minutes, I had this perfect juniper hydrosol and a thick layer of juniper oil on the top. It was astounding. And then later, I was like, I hate setting this thing up and cleaning it. I'm not very precise, and I'm kind of a slop. Let me get one of these copper stills. And that took a little bit more fine tuning, because mine doesn't have a thermometer. I have this old school kind. Um, you have to keep putting ice in the retort. I, don't, I didn't use a thermometer. I just kind of felt into it and meditated with it. But actually, my first distillation experiment was perfect. <laughs> um, I had the fortune of actually studying with a couple who were alchemists, and they studied under Fredo Robertus, who specializes in making something called spagyrics. Um, so that was the first thing I ever made, and the first botanical that I ever distilled was rosemary. And it was really fascinating because everybody in the class, um, we did a little energy work on our setup. So there's a little piece of everybody and their final result, and even though we were all distilling the same botanical, the results were wildly different. People were pulling out all kinds of different things um, in the distillation, depending on what they were focusing on, what they wanted to pull out of the plant. So it's, it's really amazing. Yeah, I mean, they say that each person makes a unique hydrosol essential oil because their own nature is intermingling with the nature of the plant that's being distilled. Yeah. And spagyrics, by the way, is a branch of study that comes from Paracelsus, who I talked to you about earlier, who was a German-Swiss alchemist in the 15th century. And he innovated a lot of things using distillation. And spagyrics is a branch of medicine that he cultivated. Yeah? Um, how do you clean that, that distiller? And That's a very good question. Do you also use a water pump with it as well? You can use a water pump. Um, I just don't have one, but um, at this point, I wish I did. Because the <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, um, you can use a water pump for sure. Um, I, you can, you know, it depends on what um, you put into it. So if you end up with something with a really high resin content, you can clean it with alcohol. That's the only thing that's gonna clean the, the, the stickiness out of it. Otherwise, soap and water is okay. Oh, I should, I should clarify that when you, you use distilled water inside the still, um, don't use tap water in the still or you don't have the mineral deposits, but you can use any kind of water in this, in the condenser. Oh, and you can use I use tap water in there. Because <laughs> whatever, it's being distilled, right? Well, it's New York, it's New York <laughs> tap water, okay. which is a little different than LA tap water. Okay. <laughs> Just as that, yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering, do alchemists um, have a position on synthetic perfumes? Mm. Is, that, is that kind of a... I'm not 
would imagine, I don't know the answer to that, but I would imagine, because I'm not a laboratory alchemist, and I don't really have an ethical stance on that, but science, uh, alchemists were really interested in synthetics in a way. Um, there's all these alchemical treatises on a thing called a homunculus. They wanted to make a human being out of a laboratory. And I think that they wouldn't have frowned upon anything that you could make because in their eyes, if anyone has a differing opinion, please throw it in. But in their eyes, we're all the one thing, just being transmuted through the imagination of the one mind. And by harnessing our own mind and being, we can participate in that transformation. And I think that would have been acceptable. Alchemy in Europe pretty much vanished, although there are still European alchemists later in the Age of Enlightenment when science, spirituality, literature, all these disciplines got separated into specialties and academies were built. You had to study these specific special specialties via an academy. Um, alchemy didn't survive that very well because it's kind of an everything goes discipline. Did I answer that question? <laughs> yeah? Yes. Um, to the earliest transformation for Egyptians and for Chinese, I think, in, in this whole Chinese wild history, um, it's anything synthetic, any, anything that when you can transform natural products, natural matter is man made material. And it's paint. So your, first of all, the Egyptians, you know, they made things gold and they take the mercury, copper, and a little bit of gold and heat it up and uh, mercury in the back of it, you know, you still. Um, but what makes it all spiritual in the Egyptian Greek tradition, and like, because yeah, really by 2000 BC, they're making synthetic paper. But in Greek, the Greek word for drug is pharmacon, and it's the same word they use for color fitness in ancient Greek. And until even now, you go to, or at least 20 years ago, you go to an apothecary to find your paints. Right. Um, and painters and pharmacists share the same guilt in the Middle Ages. Um, so this whole idea of what cosmetics comes from the cosmos, order, order, ornament, um, what's spiritual, uh, oh, uh, sorry, one other thing. Yeah. The seven planets that they knew, they thought were composed of the seven metals right. that they knew. So it wasn't like an influence, they were composed mm -hmm. of, um, uh, and Paracelsus, the tree of prima of the three caverns, the way that you take the elements and you can transform them, like you said, dissolve them, break them, break them down, kill them, revive them. Mm -hmm. So things like monthly and flowers, all that time that you see, are metaphors for man-made growth, you know, mm -hmm. make, making things grow. You know? so it's not like they're not usually trying to make Frankenstein's in the It's it's a symbol of creation. Sure. God could create man, then humans can create something in their own. But the, the fact that paint pigments were used for medicines was the idea to them that art and spiritual that creation and creativity were integral. Yeah. Born. And that's where Hermes, the idea of Hermes Trojan gives this trust to take. But the stuff is going on in at least 2,000 mm -hmm. BC where they're transforming. You know? And yes, you can make real gold now, but you need a particle for it. And I asked the if you could change the research institute into a particle for it, for the alchemy ship. Oh, <laughs> sorry. No, that's amazing. So David curated the Akhmi show that was beginning that included the Ripley scroll that did indeed belong to Nellie Palmer Hall at one point. 
and is now being cared for by David and the gang at the Getty. Yeah, and if anyone didn't hear that, um, the idea of synthetics is quite old, uh, 2,000 or more years old, and was absolutely part and parcel of the alchemical gang, so they would not have had an issue with synthetic version. Marie, Marie Louise von Franz? Yeah. Is that what you mean? Yeah. yeah. Wait, yeah. who was her teacher? Uh, Wasn't she a Jungian? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so Carl Jung actually read Visions of Zosimas, and that text, which we looked at in little tiny pieces, actually convinced Carl Jung that alchemy was really worthwhile as a psycho spiritual practice, and he found that he could relate its metaphors to his own psychotherapeutic, psychospiritual practices that he was cultivating. And he created a huge resurgence in interest in alchemy when it was very unfashionable. Um, and Marie-Louise von Franz writes through the Jungian perspective about alchemical symbolism and how it relates to psychology. That's what I would say about that, yeah. 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 question for Sid because they made all those perfumes in the show. Um, yeah, your experience is um, totally okay, totally valid with um, liking a perfume at one point in time in your life and not liking it another because perfumes are so subjective. They bring out like all these memories and us, they're deeply personal to every single person. You know, every single person could in this room could smell the lavender and it would bring up something different for them, you know? There, there's some overlap, of course, there's some shared memories, but it's also really personal. Um, and that's okay, you know? Um, yeah, my process is equally personal, right? So I, <laughs> I draw on uh, my experience with herbalism, my experience with these plants, with these botanicals, or if it's a synthetic, something that um, brings up that memory for me, um, in the hopes that only the hopes that you guys will get it, honestly. Um, and I'm, the fact that you feel that way about it really means a lot to me, because it means you, I, did, I did achieved what I set out to do. <laughs> um, I don't know, it's a, perfumer is a slow process for me. I'm a very slow perfumer. Even though I can be fast, uh, I prefer to be slow and I prefer to like work in, incrementally towards a goal, right? You, you always um, 
start a perfume with a goal in mind. Um, if you don't, you're gonna have a much harder time. So for this, these three, I really wanted to communicate the passion of and the desire of the soul, the sort of wateriness, floatiness of the spirit, and then what that happened if those two things come together. So in the third perfume, there's elements of the first and the second one. There's some ingredients that are actually combined. In the third one, even though they make this completely new thing, that third perfume wasn't working actually until I did that, which I think is really cool. It's, it's the, the alchemical process is, it's so many things to me. Um, but the way those three perfumes came together really, really felt like Yeah, that's a great question. This is a co-distillation of two kinds of lavender, but I did kind of experiment with putting two to three different kinds of plants in there. You can um, experiment with it as much as you want to. Um, it just depends on what your goals are. Yeah, that's it. Um, sorry, just a few questions or comments that I should update. Is there any apple book which is really fascinating? Uh, and she, it never occurred to me that she describes a certain floral for example, that's so delicate that it has to go through like an intermediary tommy kind of process. So I'm wondering if you could speak about some of the special area of things with certain plants. And I'm personally curious about tree resonance and woods. And it, I guess especially if there is anything local that you especially like working with or kind of rare things from abroad, but especially Yeah, I'm going on a plant walk this Sunday, actually, to, so I'm a little bit new to this bioregion. I learned herbalism in the Bay Area, and there's some overlap, but um, I'm definitely not an expert on the local uh, plants. But there are all kinds of opportunities to get to know what those plants are. Yeah, I have experimented with junipers and cedars, which grow abundantly in Los Angeles. And they do fine with heat distillation. They're not so delicate. Um, I have not done much with flowers that fall apart during the distillation process. Generally speaking, it's not advised for really delicate flowers. Like, I'm so tempted to put jasmine in there, but it just produces nothing because um, they don't respond well to the heat. Yeah. Oh, also, that book. PRS asked us if there were any books we wanted to have in the bookstore, and that was one that was high on the list, was Mandy Aftel's book, so you can find it in the bookstore if you're interested in Alchemy and Perfume. It's a beautiful one. That book's very popular, it really, like, it really turns people on to wanting to be perfumers. What's it called? Essence and Alchemy? Essence and Alchemy. Yeah. 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 How do um, alchemists explain maybe, like, like how a plant, its essential nature, and how it attains the meaning that we interpret as that nature. Is there like a morphic kind of resonance that its spirit is tapping into? Like is there a field that it's connecting to? How do they uh, attain that, that spiritual significance? Like how do they know what the personality of a lavender would be like? Yeah. Um, That's a great question. Yeah, it's such a cool question. Is that term morphic resonance, from what I understand, comes from Rupert Sheldrake, yeah. who's a contemporary biologist, who said that all beings that share a species share a certain type of energetic imprint that's the same throughout all, which is similar to the idea of spirit and alchemy. Um, Alchemists were keen observers of nature, and they sat with things, and they talked to things, and they meditated on things. Um, and I think it's true that 
observation of how things grow, how they respond, how they work with different individual bodies, and that kind of over time accumulated into an understanding of the plant's personality, I would imagine. Yeah, there's the whole planetary rulership that you were talking about, right, with Mercury, uh, with the lavender being associated with Mercury, so they could sign uh, planetary rulership with two planets, sometimes more than one, but it's really just talking about herbal energetics it's just a way to describe uh, the kind of personality of the plant and how it might react on the body. And there's so many things like um, a lot of lightning deities are connected with the planet Jupiter, which is the planet with the most lightning on it, but they didn't have telescopes, so how did they know, right? There's just some way of being still and observing and being patient and understanding that whatever is inside of Jupiter is also a new, so you find the lightning in yourself and recognize it on that planet, or I don't even know. I mean, I have a laptop and a cell phone. I'm completely distracted. But I think a lot of it comes from silence and observation. So that's like a really big part of the artistry of, of this practice. And you know, if you, you ask any office or any herbalist like what those qualities are, they might not even agree with each other. Yeah, they love to fight and squabble. Yeah. And so was right. I got a really angry email actually from an alchemist who was like, the invisible college is really unhappy with you. Because, because you're not a laboratory alchemist and we can't trace the roots of your laboratory training. And I was like, well, where the hell did I say I was a laboratory alchemist? I'm an artist, but there is a lot of, um, there's a lot of debates, there's a lot of clicks, there's a lot, a lot of, it's a lot of opinions. Subjective. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you had said you put one cup of lavender to three cups water, mm -hmm. and then you sealed it with the three parts fire, one part water. What did you mean by sealed it? Yeah. Um, so these are three. These are detached. There's like three point parts to it. And then there's a joint here and here. And what I'm doing is sealing that joint so that there's a vacuum created. Yeah, a lot of stills that you buy, especially bigger ones, come with these rubber seals that you can put on there. Um, but the old fashioned way to seal off the joints is with the rye flour paste. And you can just crack it off when you're done. And the rye flour paste, from what I understand, is just meant to mimic mud, right? tradition of using mud in the still. Mm -hmm. Got a couple more minutes, yeah. How do you obtain that space? Is it made in there? Oh, you just go to the grocery store, you buy some rye flour, and you mix it with water into a paste, and then you slap it on your distillation unit. You just need enough water to turn it into a dough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks everyone for your time and attention. I hope something.